has a story. Stories have power. They help us understand each other. This is Jessup's Journal. Dan, it's time to sign into Jessup's Journal. Thank you. Hi, I'm Doug Jessup. Welcome to this episode of Jessup's Journal. With me today, Mr. Dan Farr. So Dan, number one, thanks for coming on today. Well, thank you for having me. Now, you and I have chatted a lot, and you know, just in case people don't know, this is like Mr., you know, the, the conventions and the, all that kind of stuff. But yeah, this is Mr. Fan X. Oh, uh, you're building me up, thank yeah. you. <laughs> but we're gonna talk about that in yeah. a minute. So I wanna find out a little bit more about who Dan Farr really is. Oh, scary. Yeah, okay, so <laughs> first question, it's one of those stupidly strange ones, but where'd you grow up? I grew up here in Salt Lake. Mm -hmm. I grew up in the uh, Olympus Cove area, and I went to Skyline High School. Went on to uh, Salt Lake Community College. I played basketball there. Then I went on to the University of Utah to, to finish up my schooling and, and uh, been here my whole life. Okay, so schooling, what did you get your degree in? Business management. Ah, okay. Yeah. Actually owned a company. I've always been an entrepreneur. Um, since I was in high school, I, I started a music video dance business because I like to entertain people. Really? Kind of funny. Yeah, I was the first person uh, me and a friend, we had started that business and kind of the first group doing it. And we licensed some music videos and we would uh, do dances at high schools or churches or even did one down at BYU one time and uh, really had a lot of fun with that. So that was kind of my first experience owning a business. And then after I finished school, I started working in the 3D industry. I had a job for about a year, met some people there that we worked together and uh, I joined them. They they had broken off and started a small company. I joined them about six months after they started, became a partner there, and then five years later, we split that company, and me and one of the uh, the five partners created Daz Productions. Still around? Uh, yeah, yeah, no, they're doing great. They have an office downtown, and uh, it's a worldwide reach. You know, they have customers from all over the world. So what Daz does, if I remember correctly, is basically create 3D elements uh, for video, and some of this stuff is pretty dang cool. I mean, it's yeah. it's come a long way. So, what's the difference between what you remember when you started and what 3D looks like now? Well, the, the thing about 3D is, you know, the best way to think about the library that was put together, think of it as clip art, but for 3D. And so, people would take elements like uh, human figures or clothing or, or cars or houses or whatever it may be, put them into a a digital scene that then you can rotate around so unlike like a Photoshop app where you take a picture and you put it in it's a flat image you're not gonna you know you can't rotate that photo after it's been created where these digital scenes you'd be you know fully immersive you can bring in the camera to get closer you can affect the lighting the the textures you know basically what you know what's the surface of the 3d models look like it's basically the the work was made famous through Pixar right. with Toy Story so you think of Toy Story even though you watch the movie on a 2d screen it's a flat screen well the images were created three-dimensionally they, you know, they had the digital the information that's in the computers to render and create those images it sees it as a three-dimensional object you did something really kind of unique though you gave away the software for a while what was the deal there well as we started um, the business with my partner Chris Creek um, it was maybe a year or so into it we realized that you know he created this really fun gorilla model you know it was just okay. it, and he took it and he shaped it from the male figure and he actually created a three-dimensional morph on that so you took the male figure and then it would morph out and it became the uh, you know the the gorilla okay and we said what are we gonna do with this cool gorilla model we said what if we give it away free so you basically if you own the male figure then you can get this as an add-on to it and so what it became is we called it the gorilla marketing right and oh, so, so okay. but, but it was a freemium model so we basically started doing that as we would release new models and then we created the 3d software that rendered the stuff out we thought well how do we get distribution uh -huh. you know the, we want to reach as many people you know develop a platform once we have the platform then the models people can spend money and update and, and uh, you know create more scenes and things on their own because they use our 3d models uh, or I mean our software as the platform and so it's a, it's basically it's a similar model that people have when they get the free games on the phone now and everything so we were just we were quite a ways ahead of the 
I'd say ahead of the curve. Oh yeah. When we were doing the free stuff, we just felt like you know doing that would help us grow our business, and it did. It, you know, the business was very successful. It's still very successful today, and the, the software is actually still free. So if you want to get the, the base unit of the software, you can still get it for free. You must have met some interesting people when you're developing that software. Well, I, I did. I, you know, it was interesting. I was at a convention, uh, the NAB. Mm -hmm. I'm sure oh, yeah. you're familiar with the NAB. Oh, yeah, been there many times. Yeah. Um, National Association of Broadcasters. Exactly. So I, I, I was there with a friend of mine, and we're looking around, and we look over, and we see, that's Dick Van Dyke. Well, you know, that was yeah. pretty cool. Like, well, what's he doing here? And we talked to my friend, let's go over and say hello to him. And so we meet him, we found out that he actually has a hobby. He was really, he, he's really into the technology behind things. Mary Poppins, I think it started from Mary Poppins when he danced in front of a green screen, and that was kind of the groundbreaking technology back then. As a hobby, he, would, he had a room set up behind his house that he would render out 3D images, and he was using some of the 3D software that was in our industry that uh, we we're familiar with, and we talked to him and said, "Hey, how about we get you some 3D models to mess around with?" And he's like, "Sure, I'd love it," you know. And so we sent him some. Well, that actually developed a relationship that later on we created a the Christmas book, mm -hmm. Mr. Finnegan's Giving Chest. The character was Dick Van Dyke, and we worked with him through the process. And it was a book we published about 16 years ago, and that's where that relationship started. Was just that meeting at the convention, finding out that he had a common interest in the 3D software business and, and from there we actually created the, we rendered the images in the book using our 3D software. Oh, very so, cool. Yeah. Well, you met a, just a touch, just a couple more celebrities since then. I, I have. <laughs> okay, yeah. so you, for people that don't know, you are the guy that basically created the comic book convention idea for Salt Lake City. Where did that come from? Well, as when I was with Daz 3D or Daz Productions, uh, we were vendors at some of the different comic conventions around the country. Um, we realized that some comic book artists and some of the creative type people were using that software to render out images for comic books. And so we thought that's the big good market to be in, uh, to just to present our software. And so uh, there were some times that we, you know, as I started going to those conventions, I just got pulled into the energy of the, those events. Um, you know, I remember meeting Lou Ferrigno and Kevin Sorbo and you know other celebrities at the event, and as we were vending there, I just thought, man, why don't we have something like this in Salt Lake? And come to find out, there were a few conventions that were smaller, but it's like they were a sliver of what the big convention was. And so we we looked at uh, why you know let, let's bring that here. And I actually talked to another company about bringing it. Uh, event like that to Salt Lake, the company that we were vending at, and they didn't feel like it was the right place for them to go. You know, they were going for the bigger cities. And oh, wow, they're probably kicking themselves now. <laughs> they were, when they found out how our first event went, they said, well, yeah, we, we sure missed the boat on you, this one. You think, because I remember yeah. being at your first event, and it was just like, whoa, okay, yeah, Dan, home run, buddy. You know, so how many people attended that first conference? Around 70,000 people. Holy yeah. crap. Yeah. What were you expecting? Well, th this is interesting. We actually started out anticipating maybe 10 to 15,000 people. Mm -hmm. And so we started out at the Southtown Convention Center, and we had one of their five halls on reserve, and we had a second one that they would let us move into. So we kind of had that as a, you know expansion point. So when we announced ticket selling, and we announced we're doing the event, and we put the tickets on sale, we started seeing the tickets were selling. Mm -hmm. People were excited, and they wanted to come to the event. And so we said, oh, you know, we've got to go to three halls, then four. And then basically we realized we had expanded beyond that center. And uh, we talked to the same company manages the convention center downtown. And they basically said, well, yeah, we'll, we'll swap you out, no problem. And so we ended up downtown. And that became like a, an inflection point of, you know, what's really happening here. And people saw how big it was becoming because we had, you know, we basically had overgrown that facility. And also the other thing about being downtown is I was excited because bringing in the celebrities that we were bringing in and having vendors come in from out of state and everybody, we just felt like downtown is the atmosphere to really put our, bus, our best uh, Oh yeah, you forward. get to show off downtown. And everything. Yeah, exactly. Because oh, yeah. I remember it was just like, okay, I'm coming down there for the station. Yeah, it's going to be a nice little event. Okay. So I'm like, whoa. I mean, Parking was an issue, all kinds. Of, I mean, you know, it's like, wow, okay. 
Do you remember some of the celebrities that you had at that first event? I do. Lou Frigno and Kevin Sorbo. Mm -hmm. They were some of the very first guests that we announced because, and they were coming because I, I had developed a little bit of a friendship with them as I was at the different conventions. Around July leading up to the September event, we got uh, William Shatn Shatner on board. Oh boy. Yeah. When we announced Shatner, ticket sales went from, you know, 4,000 tickets being sold in July towards the end of July when, you know, we had uh, about twelve to 15,000 tickets sold. It was interesting to watch it. You know, once we announced Shatner, everybody realized, hey, this thing's really coming together. This is going to be a big event. We used social media for just getting the word out there. And then obviously our partner with ABC, you guys were amazing at building the excitement around the event. We were able to be on uh, you know, a lot of your programs. Oh, yeah. And, you know, as that partnership and just other supporters in the, in the uh, area had just kind of helped to create a life of its own. You know, this became bigger than just what we thought it would be. And we got to the point where, like we're saying, you know, knowing that we're thinking 10 to 15,000, but knowing that we're reaching that point in July when the mm -hmm. convention was almost two months later, a month and a half later, we realized that, okay, we're gonna need a bigger boat, right? <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, so. you, you need more than a yacht. You're, you're, yeah. you're looking, you need the Carnival Cruise yeah. Line now. And then, you know, we had some other inflection points with the, with the growth of the business. Uh, one of the things is, I mentioned moving downtown, that became a point where actually we actually sold more tickets when people realized it was building up. Mm -hmm. So we got to the point where the, the weekend before the convention, I had some dialogue with Lou Ferrigno about, he was going to come out and do some early press, but he said, I, I'm at another convention this weekend and then I have to go home on Monday. I'm going to be meeting with Stan Lee. He's going to give me a lifetime award. I said, Lou, tell Stan to come to our show. We want him out there. And I had been courting Stan oh, yeah. as management for months leading up to it. And uh, so the manager had heard that we had sold, I think we we're at 25 or 30,000 tickets sold at that point. And which, once again, that, that dwarfs most other conventions around oh, yeah. the country at that point. And when he heard that we had that many sold and that Lou had kind of leaned on him a little bit, got a call on Tuesday morning. I, I was, remember the call. I, I was actually here about ready to do Good Things Utah. Mm -hmm. And I get a, a call and I step away and I, you know, I saw who was calling and says, yeah, I'd like to do it. And I, really, you can, Stan's going to come out. And so we scheduled him for the Saturday. Once we announced that on the Tuesday, because we you know, quickly got that up on the, you know, the website and everywhere so they'd know, people would know. And it just, ticket sales just spiked again. Oh yeah. And so, the funny thing is, I actually remember because I was on the set when you got that call. Oh yeah. You know, and so here's Lou, number one. Lou is just like, I mean, my gosh, his arms are about the size of my legs. You know, this yeah. is like, okay. You know, it's yeah. like, wow. The joy that I could see, I'm going, okay, something, something's happening. Something's happening. It's there. And I do have a weird little, you know, Stan Lee story. Okay, so you got to remember, you know, so we're there, and we, you had the little press parking, you know, back there, mm -hmm. and. Um, one of your guys came up and said, uh, Mr. Jessup, we need you to move your car. Uh, I'm going, okay, I'm sorry. Uh, you're in Mr. Lee's parking spot. Uh -huh. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's like, oh, not a problem. Okay. Because you know, so, yeah. apparently his car was waiting for me to move. So I'm going, yeah. sorry, Stan. You're yeah, because right. he came in later. <laughs> yeah. yeah uh -huh. so, they, so they were ready to, to drop him off. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's like, okay. Yeah. 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 Well, getting him. I got to think that was probably one of the seminal moments for getting other people. So I got to think a lot of people wonder, how in the world do you book celebrities? There's a million different ways to get it done mm -hmm. as far as uh, getting people here. But for our first event, I had to sell on the point that Utah is a great pop culture place. Oh, yeah. And I even mentioned to them that a lot of times like Harry Potter or whatever the movie may be that the local theaters could you know, lead the nation or at least be in the top 10 theaters in the nation as far mm -hmm. as people buying tickets. And so we knew we had that pop culture uh, baseline here. And I, I use that to sell, plus the fact that when I met a lot of these managers and the celebrities, I was there as a business person. So they realized that I had a business background and that that the convention was going at least going to happen and it wasn't mm -hmm. going to just fall apart. Right. And so those things helped to get people to the first show. But when we had, after that, after the first show, the, the celebrities that came here, they had the best time ever. I remember Richard Hatch, at the day 
after the show ended the evening he just sat and just talked with my wife and I and uh, some of our staff and he said you know you guys have something magical here he said your people here in the state are amazing you know he goes I've done conventions before not only as an attendee but he actually produced some uh, att uh, conventions and he said he goes because this is just unheard of what happened here it's, it was phenomenal you know and the big thing is the attendees supported the celebrities that were there and, and really for them to go out to different conventions it, for them they want they enjoy meeting the fans but to have to leave home or to give up other opportunities there ha there's a monetary uh, element of it and for them selling the photo ops and autographs and be able to earn money for being there that that's a big deal mm -hmm. and so to have it be so successful where they had a lot of uh, interactions with the fans that made a big difference I, I've been to a lot of different conventions around the country leading up to that time and since that time where you'll see some big celebrities just sitting there just kind of really oh yeah wow yeah I don't know if it's this way at all the conventions but there was something that I noticed to me you know, partly as a vendor and partly as a media person, okay? Because, you know, us, it's good stories and pretty pictures, okay? Mm -hmm. There are plenty of pretty pictures at your place because there's this thing called cosplay. Yes. I'd heard about it, but I'd never seen it in person. And let's get real. You have the ultimate people-watching experience. It's That's like... What is the deal with cosplay? And first explain to people that don't know, what is cosplay? Well, cosplay is short for costume play. And so there's different levels that people can get involved with it. There's the level of where you just go and find a costume you like, you buy it, put it on, come and enjoy the event. Um, and I always try to make sure whenever I talk about cosplay, I let people know that you don't have to come to the event in costume. Right. But if you want to, you can. Uh, yeah. But then you go to levels where people are spending days, weeks, months, years, whatever it may be, making these phenomenal costumes. And then they go and they, they're really, they're showcasing. They become part of the entertainment there. And there's even a level of cosplay where, and this is kind of the, the true form of it, where they're playing the character. So you go around and you talk to a Batman, they're not gonna talk to you as if they're, they're, they're person underneath it. They are Batman. Oh yeah, they're the role. They are the role. And their you know, method to the, to the full extent there. And you can't, it, I, I have a lot of friends that do it. And when you see them during the event, you can't talk to them as, hey, you know, how, how's the dog doing? Or how, you know, what? <laughs> yeah. No, it's like, hmm. no, this is, this is the character. And they're, they're staying, they're not gonna break character for you. I remember there was an experience where I went around the show with Nisha and Reagan from Good Things Utah. There was this group of characters from Doctor Who. Yes. Okay. They were like cement character type yes. things. Okay. That this one was like a gargoyle or an angel or something like that. And you know, we went up and it was just absolutely still. Okay. Yes. For all we knew, it was a mannequin. Right. Okay. And then all of a sudden, one of them moved and scared the bejeebers out of them. It's like, wow! It's like, so I know exactly what you're talking about. From the cosplay standpoint, I mean, there's all kinds of different levels. Inquiring minds want to know, if Dan Farr were to ever be a cosplay person, what character would you come in as? Wow, that's, that's, that's I've been asked that question before too, and that's, that's a tough one to answer because I, I guess how I see myself versus how I think other people see me, it's, it's kind of a, uh, may, maybe different, but uh, I'd say I've always liked the Iron Man character, you know, and one thing that's kind of nice about that, you know, I don't, I don't see that I have the frame for that, you know, I'd, I'd be a little tall for, yeah. Yeah, for that, but it'd still be a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. um, I think Indiana Jones. I think Ooh, that's, that's a go. fun one. I think that'd be good. Yeah. Now talking about Iron Man. So, um, we have a, a, a friend that we both know that I've interviewed, a gentleman by the name of Brandon Fugel. Yes. Okay? So Brandon has got some pretty cool memorabilia. He does. And believe it or not, one of the memorabilia is the, the little you know, thing for Iron Man. Yes. He's got one of those that was like on the actual movie. So that it's is like, so fun. It's like, yeah. wow. So what kind of memorabilia or some kind of thing that you've gotten from all of your fan exes that's something that kind of stands out in your mind? One thing, one thing that's kind of fun, because I've never really been a super collector that, you know, and I kind of see what Brandon's done. And I know other people that have oh, amazing stuff, maybe not to the level that Brandon has, but uh, 
Uh, we did when, when we had uh, Chris Evans and Haley Atwell and Anthony Mackey and Sebastian Stan coming out, you know, how that came together is a whole other episode probably we could talk about <laughs> yeah. in, in another time, but that was just having that group prior to the, you know, the uh, Winter Soldier and everything, we, we just, the timing of it was perfect. We had them out, we got the hard uh, shield, you know, the Captain America shield. So, wow. we got, so it's an aluminum one and it's, it, you know, actual size, not from the movie, of course, but we did get all of them to sign it. Oh, wow. So that, that's fun. We have that in our TV room, just up above the TV. Is there a celebrity that might be watching this right now that you've okay. always wanted to get but haven't been able to land yet? Well, Robert Downey Jr., of course. That, that's a fun one. Harrison Ford, Ooh. he would be really exciting, you know, because we've uh, we, you know, we've had Mark Hamill and we had Carrie Fisher. Mm -hmm. You know, if we could get Harrison For Ford, he would be icing on the cake in that in that regard. You know, it's interesting. There's, uh, I've enjoyed this series Sherlock on the BBC. Mm -hmm. So Benedict Cumberbatch. Cumberbatch. Oh yeah, he would be fun. Oh yeah, crystal ball time. What do you see as the future for FanX? What I'd like to see with it is I'd like to see such high support for it where. We not only are in the convention center, but all the hotels around has a little different activities and things going on, the restaurants everywhere. So it becomes really almost like a citywide uh, event that people can participate in and, and just really enjoy the, the benefits of uh, uh, being able to be associated with other people that enjoy pop culture like, like they do. There's levels of fandom, of course. You know, there's some people that just really, they don't have any interest in meeting a celebrity or they're not really into any popular culture TV shows or whatever. But then there's the ones that basically they're so passionate about it. And I kind of look at the, on the continuum, I see you know people that have no interest whatsoever to where if you're buying a t-shirt for that, whatever fandom is, you know, you're, you're a pretty supportive fan. And then you have the ones that will cosplay or they'll basically, when they meet the celebrity from the TV show that they love, that they cry or they will just, you know, they can't even talk because they're so excited. And, you know, we've, we've had times where people have wanted to meet a celebrity and they'll, they'll stand in the line, but they'll actually let other people go in in front of them because they're just, they still need to kind of work up that uh, courage. Mm -hmm. And, and it, you know, because they know that this is going to be that kind of culmination of years of watching something on TV that they've loved or watching a movie that they love and they finally get to meet the person that helps bring that to, uh, to life to them. Thanks for bringing in all these fans. The show's called Jessup's Journal, yes. and my journal's got all these marks and you know scars and all kinds of stuff. So the, the last official question. Mr. Dan Farr, how do you want to leave your mark? I want to be remembered um, as somebody that brought a lot of happiness to others. Um, I have my Facebook page, I have a quote from P.T. Barnum. It says, the best gift that you can give is the gift of happiness to other people. And if I can help do that, I, I love doing it. That's why when I go to the events, I love watching people have those fan experiences. I love to see them with their family and they're excited to, to be there. That's what pulled me into it. It was, it was really the excitement of the other people, not because I was a super fan. You know, if I talked about the continuum. I'm maybe a little more, you know, not in the super fan area, but I, I enjoy all the pop culture stuff, but I really be, have become a fan of the fans. And when I see them have those fan moments, it just, it, it, it's like I'm living vicariously through them. Oh, I believe you, because, you know, the thing I look at is, I look at all these little kids, and I guarantee that when they get older, they're gonna say, you remember that time we met so-and-so? Yes. That was so cool. And it was because of you. Well, that, uh, that's, the, people will come up to me and they'll mention, thank you for bringing this. And I realize that it's so much bigger than me. You know, the way that power, you know, the way that people got behind us, the way that your station and others got behind and helped to make it what it is. I can't, I don't ever feel complete uh, responsibility, but I do know I've, I've played a part. And for that part, and when they thank me for it, it means a lot, and uh, you know, I, I just I hope we can do this for years to come and continue to to bring you know ba basically help people uh, ex explore their dreams and meet people that they want to meet and 
and also be inspired by them. There's so many inspiring things that happen at the event where the, uh, the celebrities say something that all of a sudden just reach uh, people in a certain way. And that's what I love seeing. Well, thank you very much for coming on to Jessup's Journal. Thank you. A couple other people we want to thank. You know, of course, we've got the folks at Five Wives. Uh, you know, they make the hand sanitizer and, yeah, they make adult beverages. Other stuff? Yeah, they make other okay. stuff. Okay. <laughs> you know, you think about washing your hands, but have you really thought about, totally serious, washing your nose? Clear oh. nasal spray. Good wow. stuff. Okay. And then, of course, you have the folks at Rustico, because it's Jessup's Journal. They're the guys that make my journals. Nice. JW Custom Hats. Taylor Cooperative, you know, we've got lots of great underwriters and we sure appreciate them. Thank you so much. Here's the thing I want people to remember. Everyone has a story. Stories have power. They help us understand each other. With another entry in a Jessup's Journal and Dan Farr, Mr. Fan X, I'm Doug Jessup, ABC 4 News. Thank you.